Uh, thanks, everybody. So uh, I credit Wen Shi for the the, uh, the new title of R4SS as the, the fantastic, very fantastic R4SS package. Um, it, it's also kind of uh, a total mess. So, so this talk is going to be sort of contrasting, you know, the great success of this package that's been sung the praises of today with or this week uh, with the fact that behind the scenes, it's, it's sort of a nightmare. So, um, you know, what, what can we learn from, from the success and failure of our first SS and, and what can we, can we do to, um, you know, improve the next generation of output processing? Does this, is this working? There's a, okay, so just a quick outline. Um, I'm gonna talk, we haven't actually talked that much about the assessment process at all. I mean, we, we heard a little bit, um, you know, I, I think on Monday, um, Akira Hayashi spoke about the sort of big software uh, vision for, for closing the loop between, you know, input running models, output writing reports and so on. And then, you know, Arnie and, and Bjarke this morning, you know, have, have shown that in Europe, they've actually sort of achieved that. Um, uh, but I, I'm gonna just sort of talk about my local perspective of, of a much messier workflow, but that's still seeking that same vision. Um, I'm gonna give a brief sort of history and overview of the R4SS package itself. Many of you have used it, but some have not. Um, uh, and then briefly lessons learned and thoughts for the next generation. Um, I, I thought about trying to, you know, I, I was one of the seven or so invited speakers here. I thought, well, if I'm speaking about uh, output processing, I should do a survey of all the different models and what they do and, and compare output processing methods. But, but I don't think that talk is as interesting and I don't have the authority and many others do to, to speak about how other models are being done. So, so this is very much my own personal perspective. Uh, so uh, I had the pleasure of doing a stock assessment for Big Skate. Uh, there's a picture of it and um, there's a, a cover of my 200 and some page report uh, that was all written in R Markdown. Um, it's a, it was the first stock assessment for the species, so we were exploring data that had never been looked at before. Um, and, and it was, a, you know, it was, it was sort of what we went to school to do. We didn't go to school, you know, I, I have a PhD in fishery science from the University of Washington. I, uh, well, actually it's in quantitative ecology, but regardless, uh, you know, I didn't go to school to process CSV files and, you know, debug model inputs. You know, I, I, I went to school to become an ecologist and discover new things, um, you know, to help manage our fisheries sustainably. So, uh, you know, I think one of the lessons I've learned along the way is if we can make the computers do the boring stuff, um, then that frees up time for the good stuff. So uh, I went and scraped my hard drive and, and looked at every report file, every stock synthesis output file, um, associated in my big skate models folder and uh you know they all have a file creation date and and within a, a two month period there were 847 independent model runs of stock synthesis um, you know on monday scott talked about sort of you know five seconds versus seven seconds you know in, in optimizing speed of things um, and speed obviously matters but you know in this case the model takes about four minutes to run including inverted and hessian that speed wasn't the issue. I, you know, I'm, I'm doing it all on a laptop. I have access to faster servers. I could, you know, run things in parallel, but it's just not worth it. For me, the issue is keeping track of 847 models, figuring out which of those models is the best one. You know, I, I'm, uh, uh, you know, we heard uh, Ernesto talking about, you know, um, uh, ensemble modeling, uh, I guess that was yesterday. You know, for me, uh, of the, the dark blue here, um, you know, those are sort of the, the candidate models that, you know, could be the best model. And, and there was one best, you know, I'm not ensemble modeling. I, I'm, you know, trying to look through a whole bunch of possible models and saying, okay, this is the one I want. Um, and make, you know, that was uh, on the order of about 100 potential candidate models. But then within the one that I want, you know, there's a bunch of likely approach files where for maybe a half dozen parameters, I'm going to look at you know, a dozen different values of each of those parameters. Uh, you know, I'm going to do a bunch of sensitivity analyses to say, what if I, you know, modeled natural mortality differently? What if I, you know, turn this parameter on or off? What if I use this different growth curve? Um, and then every time I 
you know, discover, oh, I, I want a new, you know, candidate model. This is actually a better, you know, best model. Um, then I'm going to want to rerun all the likelihood profiles, all the sensitivity analyses for that new model. And, you know, then we have an intensive uh, review process for the U.S. West Coast, um, where we have independent reviewers, we have some local reviewers, um, and, you know, during the course of that review, they're making suggestions. And, and in particular, um, the big skate is quite data poor, and we had a, a prior distribution on catchability that was somewhat poorly derived. Uh, well, 12 years earlier, Patrick Cordue was a, was a reviewer for a previous skate assessment. And, and during the review panel for that assessment, they came up with a prior on the back of an envelope. Um, and so we just, it actually was very pragmatic to apply that to big skate. But, but the review panel in 2019 said, you know, that's not good enough. Here's some factors that you really need to incorporate. You know, they were convinced by the value of having a prior because it kept the stock from going crazy. But, but um, uh, they had some, you know, compelling suggestions for how to improve the prior. So, so the, really, the only change that occurred during the review panel was to adjust the prior on catchability of our sort of most influential survey. But, you know, because I had some automated tools, you know, nothing like the the full, you know sequential script of Arnie's vision of the TAF, but um, you know, be, I had some tools to basically copy my entire directory of, of um, you know, model sensitivities for the previous model into a new directory, uh, iteratively change the prior in each one of those model input files and rerun all you know, 60 or so sensitivity analyses. Uh, the first time I did it, it turned out I had actually turned off the, the phase of the uh, catchability. So, all models were wrong. So that showed that, you know, you do want to be able to get in there. I, I mean, I, I think having text files that you can actually open up and confirm yes or no, it's the right thing. You know, maybe the text file is just sort of like, uh, you know, it, like, it, you know, in the US, we have some struggles figuring out how to vote. And, and, you know, to me, the text file is like the paper ballot, where even if it's a computer that you're voting on, you, you want some sort of record that, that, you know, is transparent and, and doesn't depend on R or a database to view. You, you can just open it up and, and look at it, even if it's ugly. Um, so, you know, this is the context we're coming from in, in thinking about, you know, the next generation stock assessment is, is how, do we, how do we do all this in an efficient way um, where we don't make mistakes along the way? We're, we're going to be short on time. It's not like we're going to have 10 times more stock assessment people in the future. Um, so, you know, how do we build tools that, that help this process? Um, we've, we've heard this story before that, you know, the, um, well, the, 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 the best way uh, to describe it in my mind is this quote from Monday, you spend 90% of your time trying to run the damn model and the next 10% of your time making plots and writing the report and whatnot. And then you go home, drink a bottle of wine and forget everything you just did. So, <laughs> you know, how do we, how do we, you know, I think the transparent assessment framework, you know, before you drink the wine, you, you clean up all your scripts that were probably really ugly. You take out all the, the swearing and then you upload them to the TAF database and then you drink the wine. Maybe that's, the, yeah, well, um, <laughs> so, uh, we've heard a lot about our, um, uh, here's the history of R for SS in a nutshell. So, um, uh, and the secret to the success of R for SS is really CAPM, uh, uh, the IATTC and Mark specifically preceding CAPM and Simon Hoyle. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're the, the, the key, you know, going back. So Ian Stewart, I should give credit, was the one who originated this. And, you know, Rick had developed stock synthesis, Ian was learning R and thought, oh, you know, R is good for, you know, model diagnostics. And I mean, you know, it's a, originally we thought of it as a statistical language so we can, you know, do some statistics on our model output and it's good for plotting so we can make some plots. And, and um, so Ian just wrote a script for his own purpose for exploring models himself. And then other people said, oh, that seems really useful. Can you share that with me? So I became a postdoc with Rick, well, first, First, Rosie Hurst offered me a job here in Niwa and, and uh, for 
personal reasons, I wasn't able to actually take the job. And so I, I was scrambling for an alternative and Rick uh, set me up with postdoc starting in 2008. Um, and Ian Stewart handed over his code and said, you know, I'd love for somebody else to maintain this. And then in the fall of 2008, I went to a ITTC workshop. It was on, um, I think it was a spatial workshop. And Simon Hoyle was there and said, hey, that's cool. Why don't you put it, you know, on the internet somewhere where we could all get it. And, you know, so I, I put it on Google code at the time um, and it was using SDN for version control. But I've since transferred to, to GitHub and the SDN converted to Git. And so I have the full history of commits. So in the gray here in the bottom is the, is the um, commits per month, which peaks at about 25. So, you know, about an average of a commit per day. Um, uh, and so that, that first IATTZ workshop, the predecessor to CAPM, was, was sort of the, the beginning of R4SS as an open source online tool. Um, a year later, IATTZ has another workshop uh, that was on uh, population processes, and, and I got to attend that. Um, and it was at that workshop that, that I sort of got inspired to learn about making an R package. And so I got on to CRAN um, shortly thereafter. Um, two years later, there was ITTC workshop where uh, that was on tagging data. Um, and uh, Simon was again there and he sits me down and shows me the Multipan CL uh, Java viewer with tabbed, you know, selection of, to get to the figures you want. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. That's much, much better than w the way we had been looking at figures either in the R GUI or in a long, long PDF file. Uh, but I didn't know Java. So uh, I went and, you know, got some open source HTML tab code that, uh, you know, is now the basis for how we view the, the figures in R. Um, uh, I guess just continuing on this history in 2004, um, uh, I switched from Google Code, which was shutting down to, to uh, GitHub. Um, I learned about R Oxygen that automated the process of the help files and assured that your help file actually had alignment with your, um, with your script. Um, uh, I, I think a notable uh, thing, ENT on leave, uh, I had to take uh, medical leave for almost six months in, in the 2005, 2006, or 15, 16 period. Um, and I was very pleased that the project didn't die. You know, at that point it had, it had achieved a level of sustainability. There was enough contribution from other folks, uh, in particular uh, Kelly and Chantel in the back of the room that, that it was able to keep going even during a period where me as sort of the main uh, developer, you know, maintainer was, was unavailable most of the time. Uh, uh, automated testing is something that Kelly's going to talk about at 2.30 this afternoon, so please don't leave early. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, the blue line is, is just taking from the Git commits the total number of lines inserted minus the, the cumulative number of, of lines deleted. Um, somehow that doesn't actually, the 400 and some thousand total difference doesn't actually match the number of lines in the repository today. So I don't, I don't know why, it, it may be that branches are being double counted or something like that. But um, where it stands today, there's about 36,000 lines of R code uh, that includes the comments that, that become the documentation. Um, and then there's about 250,000 lines of uh, of stock synthesis input and output files that are uh, there as examples for testing. Those aren't uh, just as of now and or a couple weeks ago when Kelly convinced me to, to put it back on CRAN after a long hiatus of not bothering, um, I, uh, I realized that you could exclude those model example files from the package because CRAN has some limits on how big a package can be. Um, so if you download it from CRAN, you get a sort of a slimmer version than if you um, install from GitHub. Or maybe even you'd have to clone the, I don't know. Uh, so there we are, um, just very briefly, example use of this thing. Um, you know, you can either install it now from CRAN, uh, which is convenient because it doesn't require all the dependencies, uh, or you can install it from, from GitHub to get sort of the, the latest, greatest changes. Um, I, I only just recently learned that you don't have to install all of dev tools. You can now just install the remotes package, which is much slimmer. Um, so that should, that should help a little bit with the new users getting up to speed on this. Um, and then 
you know, the, the sort of core functions of the package are you run this um, SS output function that, that basically parses the stock synthesis big text file report file into an, a list in R, which is a, essentially a list of data frames and vectors and variables and whatnot. Um, that, unfortunately, for historical reasons, there's an imperfect match between the list objects and the, in particular the names are often inconsistent, which has been a mess. Um, uh, and then uh, you can run this ssplots function. And the ssplots function um, used to just be sort of everything all together in one giant script. And then at one of those ITTC workshops, um, I uh, had got inspired to split it up into a bunch of sub functions, each of which can be sort of edited more easily on their own. Uh, so when you run that, you get now this HTML output with tabs. If there's some information about the version you're using and whatnot, we could make this much richer. Uh, uh, you can tab through them, look at, you know, pretty pictures of, uh, you know, what years of data you have, selectivity. Um, each, each of the tabs probably, you know, has dozens of plots below it. Um, you know, the benefit of the HTML view compared to old style was that we could have, you know, hyperlinks and references and things like that. And, and so that was just a big improvement over um, sort of previous ways of, of viewing uh, the output. Um, as of uh, just, I guess, this spring, uh, Christine Staywitz added uh, or fulfilled a longstanding wish I'd had to be able to have some, some tables in that HTML view, whereby viewing the tables there, first of all, they're all in the same place as the figures, um, and second, you know, you can add highlighting colors and things like that that you don't get um, when you have uh, just a text view. Obviously, there's many more sophisticated, you know, interfaces that you could build on this, but this is built by, you know, fishery scientists without, you know, lots of programming knowledge. There's some really boring plots, but that, you know, you sort of need to have in your model output. There's other figures that we put a lot of care and thought into. Um, two notable things about the the big skate model I've just spoken about. We use the gross succession model that Mark contributed to, uh, I mean, in collaboration with Rick to stock synthesis, because um, there was some really crazy growth. Uh, and there's also some really crazy uh, sex ratios in the, um, by length. Uh, so that it's not just a gear selectivity thing, it seems, because, you know, at a given length, the sex ratios um, uh, sort of dramatically changing in a way that, that it convinced me that, any model we ever look at has to have the option to have uh, different sexes represented differently. Um, I talked already about the, the history of sort of rushing through um, uh, the sea of plots. Thanks. Uh, you know, in addition to sort of those core functions of reading the output and making the default plots, then there's a whole bunch of other functions that have been added for things like comparing across models. Here's the base big skate model compared to one where I use the um, uh, multipliers on, uh, catch multipliers is the option that Rick added to stock since this is not that long ago. Um, and I was able to get very similar model results, but with much greater uncertainty, but I also had to make a bunch of assumptions about the priors on those multiplier parameters. Um, you know, it's not just output that we want to think about, it's tools to then feed back into the input files, you know, the, the functions for running profiles depend on, um, you know, iteratively uh, changing an input file, rerunning a model, and then, you know, compiling and summarizing the output. So, uh, yeah, I, we've talked about the, the process of um, writing reports, but basically the more efficient you can make it, the happier you are. Uh, two metaphors for sort of the current state of stock synthesis. Uh, this is a favela in Rio. Um, it's, you know, you don't need a, a architect to design a cathedral for you to have habitable housing that, you know, is functional for people. Um, you can put, you know, a good coat of paint on it and it can look beautiful. Um, but it, it may still have some problems as you, you know, <laughs> try to add to a system that wasn't built to handle the, the, um, the original lack of design. So, yeah, the challenges are, you know, the sort of lack of proper design. Um, uh, you know, we tried to maintain compatibility. We've heard, you know, 
people talking about versions and, and you know, there are still folks out there using stock synthesis 3.24 from 2012. And even if you've moved on as we have in my lab, we're reassessing stocks that have been last assessed, you know, under earlier versions. And we want to be able to compare the results of the old models and the new models. So, so you know, at, at minimum, you need some tool to be able to sort of bring in output from old model platforms or even a different model fundamentally um, to be able to compare those results. And I, I think R is a good tool for that. Um, uh, yeah, you can read the rest. Um, people have said, well, how could I apply R for SS to my model? And my advice is don't just take the code. It's all open source. Um, take the code that works and, and start fresh. Um, so uh, I'm short on time here, but maybe I can squeeze into the break a little bit. Um, uh, I think the key successes of r for ss are, first of all, that rode the coattails of stock synthesis. I mean, it's been synergistic. I think it's the success of stock synthesis has, you know, been in part because r for ss was available to, to facilitate its use. But, um, you know, for sure, this couldn't have become the fantastic thing it did without a model that lots and lots of people were using that justified all the contributions and provided a huge pool of people to contribute more. Uh, you know, the R language that we've talked about a lot, for good or bad, it, it's just the lingua franca of fishery science today. Um, you know, I know there's some generational differences of how common it is. Um, some, you know, the younger kids are using R in different ways with, with tidyverse that, that aren't familiar to me, but, um, you know, times change. But for now, you know, R is, is the, the duct tape that, that holds us all together. Um, and the open source model has been really successful in this case. Um, I, I do think it's worth noting that it's not the only way to interact with stock synthesis output. There's lots of people who, who read, you know, the text files into Excel or other ways. Um, there's people who write all the input files themselves, you know, from scratch, but, you know, so therefore they're not locked into the system and maybe that takes a little of the pressure off and there's a, a backup if something goes wrong and I code something incorrectly. Um, you know, in terms of the open source, uh, we now have, I think, 28 total contributors, 23 of whom have, you know, contributed directly through pushes or pull requests and GitHub. Um, and, you know, that collective, you know, hive mind, you know, can create beautiful things that no individual could have thought of themselves. Um, as Andre said, if I give it to Ian and a thousand people ignore it, then I feel like I could have made a difference. Uh, so that was a quote from your talk. I, Andre contributed a diagnostic plot for conditional agent length data that most people ignore, but at least we have the option. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, wrap it up here. I think, you know, the front table here, as is common in fishery science, meetings, you know, is mostly white men. Um, and that's sort of the, the history of, of uh, you know, the fishery science field, but it's become, you know, much more diverse. And, uh, you know, the next generation, many of whom have been taught by Andre uh, in his lab of, you know, something like 40 grad students and postdocs, uh, you know, it's actually a majority women. Um, I mean, that's over time. Yeah, hopefully. Um, you know, I think the racial diversity in the fishery science community is definitely lower than in the, the world at large. Um, the world at large, many of whom are, you know, dependent on the fish that we're <laughs> trying to manage with these models and, and maybe also trying to learn these models. And so, you know, I think trying to develop these tools in an inclusive way that, that uh, facilitates, you know, or welcomes contributions from people from all walks of life um, is going to make the tools themselves better. So finally, thanks for letting me run over. Uh, my suggestions for, you know, the next generation are develop open source R packages, just as we've done already, but <laughs> do it better <laughs> the next time. Um, be inclusive and support contributions for a broad community and, and have that community include people who are expert in our packages, but also people who are actually involved in the production stock assessment arena um, and you know, maybe some professional coders as well. Um, provide the framework, but then you know, don't be too rigid and, and allow people to contribute in a variety of ways. Um, and then don't, don't, yeah, count on maintaining it forever. And then you know, don't try to make it perfect because you'll never succeed. 
just make it so you can keep keep improving. Uh, so thanks to all these folks. Um, you know, Kelly Johnson in particular is is the person I go to whenever I have questions about our packaging or you know visions for how software should be developed. Um, uh, and and all the the contributors to the package and all the users, many of whom are here. And thanks for your support. Okay, thanks, Ian. Um, you know, I can't overstate how much R4SS has you know, made doing stock assessments easy for myself, save so much time. Um, one, one example is for the Tuna Commission assessments, basically what we do is we take the HTML code and just stick it on our website, and then our stock assessment report is only like 10 pages long because all of the information is there and it's easily available. And, um, and it looks really good, so it looks like we really know what we're doing, and it's a nice <laughs> website, but all I did was just change a couple of terms in the HTML code and put it on there, and it's, it's really good. So thanks a lot, um, Ian and everyone else. It's, it's a great uh, achievement that you've made. Um, any questions? Jim. I'm dying to know what was the most tedious part of your skate assessment that you dislike the most yeah. <laughs> oh by far the data processing yeah that's i mean we're i mean kelly in particular is working on a pack fin utilities program but you know i i don't know how things work in the ic's arena but you know in alaska they have it good because all you know it's a single state collecting the data but for much of the u.s each of the individual states is collecting landings in a different way. Um, we have some central databases, but then you get emails saying, oh, don't use what's in the database, use what's in this Excel spreadsheet instead. Um, and so that, that end of things, the 90% the is, that's by far the worst. Um, and, and you know, in, somewhere I had a link to the big skate assessment files. Uh, you know, it's ugly. Uh, it's, it's not the, the transparent assessment framework. It's 37 R scripts that aren't sequential at all, but you know, Somewhere in each of those is the steps I took in every stage of the data processing to get the data into stock synthesis. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, the biggest, someone described that the, the most important, was it Kareen on Monday saying that the most important user of your documentation is yourself, right? Six months or two years later. And by having your future self and by having it on GitHub, I find it easier to search GitHub than my own hard drive. Yeah, Andre. Yeah, as someone who used to do assessments and know people who do assessments, but reviews a lot of assessments, uh, I think the whole R4SS has really spe speeded up the review process considerably because we've now got to the point where most reviewers have seen R4SS, they know what they can ask for. So in the good old days, I remember when Rick and I did an assessment together, people would say, well, could you do world peace as a sensitivity test? And we'd say, no. Um, <laughs> POP, remember, back in the day? Oh, it was actually, Jim was also on that. That was a good team. Um, and so there was sort of a, you just didn't know what questions you could ask and how long it would take. And I think the package development has actually made that we can be much more thorough in terms of how we review things. And I think that shouldn't be ignored because it has really, it, it, it's educated the reviewers. I think it's educated the process. Um, not many reviewers can look at the input files for SS, but there's certainly some who go in and say, you idiot, you didn't even do what we asked you to do, and I know where you got it wrong. So I think, you know, that's so much easier than the old bespoke models where, you know, Jim, would you please run something? Oh, thank you, Jim. I have no idea what you did, but <laughs> I'm assuming you did what we asked you to do. So I, I, I don't think we should ignore that side of the project, man. Uh, Rick, and then Alan. Yeah, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ian. And I think the only thing I would just add in here is the, the value of being able to work so closely with Ian and others on deliberating on what should we do inside of SS and what should we do in, in R for SS and always being uh, thoughtful about that, that interface. And we didn't design it from the beginning. And you know, when you talk about you know, this being a, uh, a house of cards that we've built <laughs> over time, uh, we, it's not designed from scratch, and you know, I certainly would advocate that uh, when you design something new, to be really thoughtful about this interface 
to the output process. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I saw Alan have his hand up. I don't know if you have a mic. Yeah, th thanks, Ian. Um, great talk and history there. <clears throat> um, and as everybody says, we definitely appreciate all the work everyone's done on R4SS. And I, I want to add to what Andre was saying, and it probably relates to what Rick was saying, is that what I've found during these reviews also is that the reviewer sometimes ends up contributing to R4SS and <laughs> contributing their ideas, like the Francis method of data weighting. Chris Francis actually contributed the code to make the plots and the outputs, which greatly, um, which added to the whole process of using that method. So I don't know how widely spread that method would be used if Chris hadn't put it into R for SS. So there, there's a lot of benefit um, yeah, in that yeah. also. I should give Andre's co-author on that Francis waiting function. But absolutely, that's true. Well, since you mentioned ASCII files, I have to say something. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, of course, ASCII files have, have, have an interest on in themselves. I mean, the R script is a text file that we want to keep and maintain, and we want to see what changed and all of that uh, for the sake of transparency and everything. But as, as um, uh, I think Anders said uh, yesterday or two days ago, we, are, we should be writing the next generation, the software for the next generation of computers. And in my mind, it doesn't make sense that we keep doing stock assessments in our own laptops, which is fine. You have your ASCII files there, you search your files, fair enough. But we have to think about a situation where we are actually using cloud computing, distributed computing, where you are using uh, clusters and things like that. And for that, there's m much better tools these days than using ASCII files. And we need to have that on, on the back of our heads. Okay, uh, if there's no other questions, um, thanks a lot, Ian. <laughs>